Um, before I start, uh, anybody who does a literature search on demand management and flexibility will realize that I'm a poser, that I'm up here, I'm not an expert. Uh, so I have to give acknowledgement to some important people. Mark Dyson and Harry Masters did a lot of work uh, this spring and summer to help uh, create some of the analyses that I'm going to talk about today. And for those of you who are more uh, interested in more of the detail, uh, there's a PowerPoint deck that was put together that summarizes the, um, the information I'm going to talk about today. So um, just very quickly to remind everybody, uh, the, the real issue at hand here is as you, as you bring more and more variable renewables online, their capacity utilization goes down. And so here's a chart of the percent of annual energy use or load, uh, and then the renewable capacity is a percent of that need. And early at lower penetrations, they match fairly well. And when you get up to around 60%, they start to diverge. And in fact, you have to get out to about 150% capacity of, of actual need to meet about 90% of the actual energy. So that, that's the issue we're dealing with here. And so the question is, well, uh, you know, and that arises because there's a mismatch between supply and demand. And so the, the question that we're going to talk about for the next hour or so is, well, can we shift those loads around in a way that, that helps us? And, and that's what I'm going to talk about, uh, and then we'll have some discussion. So um, let me just get back. The basic methodology that was used here was we started with the uh, NREL's uh, Renewable Energy Futures Study and also RMI's um, Reinventing Firework. In, in, in both cases, there's about 60% variable renewables, um, and then about another 20% of firmer renewables that get you up to about 80% penetration. So we're starting with a base case around 80%. Uh, and then what we did is we identified end use loads that could potentially be moved around um, and um, thought about how much they could be shifted uh, and how much value they would bring. The other thing I should say is that we, we did most of the modeling around the ERCOT uh, Sec system um, because we know a lot about that system. We know a lot about its end uses. We have a lot of data. And so we use it as our base case. And when we scaled it up to try to minimize the uh, bias that might be introduced for the whole of the United States, is we looked at the ratio of national end use uh, to ERCOT end use. So, for example, ERCOT's going to be much more heavily uh, weighted towards uh, HVAC, you know, cooling than, say, the upper Midwest and the Northeast. So we made some adjustments there, and I think roughly yeah, the numbers are, are, are going to track just fine. Uh, so that's the methodology. Um, I'm going to cheat by because I couldn't draw this, uh, and this is you know this is not sh this is not giving this is not I'm going to cheat, and there's not I, I also even though I wanted to bump up my pulp and paper products uh, uh, stock. I didn't print enough for everybody. I want you guys to share, and just like in kindergarten. Um, and the main point being here, to pass these around, I can move some more around as necessary. The main point being that if you look uh, at the upper chart, which is our starting point, there's a, a mismatch, an obvious mismatch between um, the uh, supply and demand. And going across the, the x-axis is the hours of the day, 1 through 24, and going down the y-axis are the months of the year. And not surprisingly, this is, again, ERCOT data. You can see in uh, February, March, April, May, there's periods of low net load in the middle of the day when the sun is beaming, you don't need much HVAC. And then you get into the summer months, and it's late afternoon, and there's all of a sudden it's really hot, and you have these, these mismatches. And so the question with this heat map is, how do we move the blues to the reds? Uh, basic. I mean, sorry, the reds to the blues. So that's, that's kind of what's going on there. Um, to jump to the answer, well, actually, no, I'll talk, to you, I'll talk to you about the technology. So we looked at residential plug loads, residential commu and commercial cooling, residential and commercial space heating, and EVs. And we looked at EVs from the perspective of one-way charging, so smart charging, V1G. They add a load to the system. Uh, and we looked at it as an additional load, and we just want to make sure we can put it at the right time. So th that's how they were modeled in. Um, so to jump to the answer, um, basically, in our core scenario, if you move these loads around, you can save about 5% of total load or about 25% of the remaining 20%. That's what you get. So that's a good thing, because we just tackled 25% of the problem. It's not such a good thing, because there's 75% of the problem. 
Um, I'd have to go back and look at the assumptions. Let me come back to that. Yeah, I can look it up. Um, a, a fair number, but not an overwhelming number. Um, we also looked at, um, we thought about, and, I, and the results differ um, about what, what the, the mode of what the, the EVs were being used in, because you know, if they were autonomous vehicles and they were being highly utilized, that might be a slightly different story. Um, and, and mostly what happens there is they're high, highly utilized, so they're less available for flex. Um, the second thing to note on the, fl uh, the flex of these resources is it's worth about $7 billion a year in production cost savings at $4 an MMBTU. So uh, that's a good thing. Um, and it's also worth about $15 per year in avoided capital around uh, reducing peaker plants. So there's a, a CapEx component to it as well. Um, and, and so, I mean, I, I guess, you know, I, I want to say, so the story is you flex, it saves money, it's about 25% of the problem, but there's still 75% remains. So in, in the time that remains, what I'd really like to do is just talk a little bit more about um, what we can do. W one thing to note, actually, um, for those of you who are into electricity, is the low duration curve. This is the peak over here. When you, when you put in a high penetration of renewables, you don't actually reduce that peak. As you start to flex load, you actually get a pretty big drop in the peak. That's where you get a capacity uh, savings on the, on the, um, on the actual, um, the actual uh, capital that's required. So let's talk about money and talk about our technology. So on, on this chart here, this two by two, remember I was a consultant. So we have on the Y axis, uh, in the money and out of the money. And on the X axis, we have lower impact and higher impact. And what we see is that we have things like smart domestic hot water, smart plug loads, smart cooling, and smart EV charging are in the money. They look pretty good right now. Uh, but you have things like electro uh, thermal storage, where you're actually just hitting, heating bricks, is not in the money. And importantly, ice storage, and, and uh, Joe may have some things to say about, well, not. how about ice, uh, just water, cold water, but it's not in the money either. And so the implications here are important because what we want to do is we want to move the things that are not in the money to being in the money. So that's uh, it's partly a research question, and it's partly uh, how do we incent industry to get the m m numbers to move the right way. And then we want to maximize the impact of those things in the upper right quadrant by, say, for example, using policy to move people over to smart electric hot water heaters instead of using dumb gas heaters, which I have one. Um, so that's, that's some of the sort of here and now that, of what we need to do. Um, and then I'd just like to finish up by talking a little bit about time scale. So there's things that we do to manage variability on the grid at the 10 to the more minus 2, 10 to the minus 4 seconds time scale. Um, we, we need to manage things, though, probably all the way out into the days and months, because if you take a look at the bottom part of that chart, which is after we've moved uh, loads around, you can still see there's pretty clear seasonal shifts that need to, to happen. Um, and so what we really want to do is our, our, our solutions that we've come up with really look at uh, an impact that are sort of on the minutes to hours to about a day time scale. And so we don't have a mechanism yet and didn't, weren't able to model effectively what do we do on the um, day to week to fortnight and then to seasonal. And so that's where the conundrum lies. Um, what that means then is that uh, obviously storage of some sort is important. Um, it's important that we think about how industrially we might use demand response in the order of several days to a week. You can tune smelters down, you can tune down uh, integrated steel, you can tune down cement, but you gotta pay for it because those industries run by tons and if you, got, you gotta move the tons. And so if you don't move the tons on one day, it's hard to make up the tons on the next day. Now, one exception to that is if you're in an industry where there's uh, excess capacity, you can actually make up for the lack of tons on one day or one week or even one month in a, in a subsequent time period. How the market would actually price that and how you do it, I, I don't know, uh, except that I, 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 what I do know is you can figure out sort of what the cost of not utilizing your capacity is, and there's probably a fair market that could be established. The other problem, though, is that there's no, that the, because we're entering a new world, is we don't know the probability of these events 
maybe we'll learn to get some data later today, um, that would help you to try to figure out how frequently you're going to be asking people to tune down their, um, their factories. Um, the last thing I'd like to sort of, and I guess two more things. One is, uh, although this sounds crazy, when I was a kid, we used to have snow days. Like it would snow, you didn't go to school, and like you didn't have business, and you, just didn't, you had fun as a kid. Is there a number that we should calculate for a wind day or a sun day here in the US where we go like, yeah, it's not windy, so everybody chill out? <laughs> I, know that, I, know, I know people don't like that idea, but I don't think that would crush our economy. We should at least know what that number is. Um, the final thing I'd say is in developing nations where I get to work some, it's going to be very helpful if we help bring demand and supply into synchronicity and we try to avoid this kind of that low duration curve and, and creating these real mismatches. And I, and I think one of the ways to do this is to think about helping developing nations develop energy systems which are about energy services, not power. And so that you actually are always trying to figure out, well, here's the service you need. How do I deliver that? And how do I then match my supply to that? But the long and the short being is that if they go down the same road that we've gone down, then they're going to be trying to fight and cobble back rather expensively more than doing it right the first time um, what, what could be a problem that's solved in advance. So I'm, I'm going to stop there. Uh, and there's far uh, more experienced people who maybe can now add to the country. Contribute to the discussion. Uh, yes. Really quick, um, you said you could. S Thanks. You could save five percent of total load with flexibility. I'm just wondering if you could, um, and that's twenty-five percent of the last twenty percent. I'm just wondering if you could um, clarify exactly what you mean by that. Um, is that a reduction in peak demand, or is that a reduction in? Total uh, no, it's it's energy. It's energy. It's okay. energy. So basically. Um, a hot water heater that was running in the evening, um, you run it and, and there's excess uh, demand over supply at that point. You move it earlier in the day and run it when there's, there's extra capacity. Gotcha. So, so it's, you, a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a, it's a preventing curtailment. Yeah. And so, yeah. and then, and then from there, based on the mix, the, the mix of, of carbon, uh, using uh, plants, we calculated this CO2 reduction of 2025 percent, basically. So I have a clarifying question, and then we'll go Armin, Klaus, uh, Peter, and Ken. I think I have everyone. So on, on the first clarifying question, what's the data underlying the simulation? Meaning, do, do you act, are you actually using some metered uh, circuit level data to understand the loads? Or are yeah. The, the, the actual data was modeled on the ERCOT 8760, so hourly data, and we know what the loads are for ERCOT as well. So the, the, the base data around ERCOT is a very well-known data set that we have that provides hourly loads by, by device type. Okay, so move on to Armin. Yeah, just a couple of comments, and I apologize. I wasn't here the first two days where you covered a lot of the grid stuff. These are really comments or observations. One is, I think this point about seasonality of the problem versus daily is a really important point to clarify. You know, diurnal storage discharge is going to help, you know, peak management frequency control, but it's not going to address this problem. The second observation is just, you know, kind of cart before the horse kind of issue. Mm -hmm. It just, you know, it seems your last comment about, you know, maybe developing countries should think about growing their grids in a way that avoids, you know, essentially works around the intermittency problem. I just don't know how realistic that is. I mean, the first and foremost thing is how do we get energy to supply industry, commercial, you know, residential demand. It, it seems a little backwards to be saying, you know, how do we basically construct an entire energy system to accommodate intermittency rather than provide the energy, um, especially when there are other options for low carbon electricity. Just an observation about asking the right question, I guess. I, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, uh, thanks, Ken. Um, I'm Armin Cohen. I'm executive director of the Clean Air Task Force, which is an environmental NGO that um, does a lot of work on decarbonization policy, uh, both at the federal level in the Clean Power Plan and that sort of thing. We're also working um, 
to understand low carbon energy systems. We do a lot of modeling of um, very low carbon pathways for the electricity sector. We also do uh, a lot of work in technology innovation in the area of renewables, um, uh, carbon capture and storage, and nuclear, particularly advanced nuclear. I, I guess I would like to just comment on the developing nations work. I mean, it, it, what we see there is people are bringing in the grid, mini grids, and standalone solar, that there's often a very immature view of how to manage your demand along with the supply. And so what you'll see is there will be big peaking needs uh, in the evening because lighting can be a dominant load, uh, and yet no movement to go to LED lights. Uh, and so actually getting the demands right early is very important. And same as with mini grids, they have real trouble dealing with inductive motors. They tend to push the, the grid out of its limits and so if they started with either, you know, electronically commutated DC motors or they started with soft start motors, they could actually sweat the assets a lot more. It would lower the cost of electricity and it would improve the, the financial viability of the businesses that use that power. So I would argue actually quite the contrary. Getting it right is the best thing we can do for these developing nations. I guess I think, well, it's a longer answer, I guess. Uh, my point being mostly and more generally is that getting the supply demand mix and synchronicity right for them from the beginning will help them regardless of the power system they're using. And in the case of where they are using uh, uh, some levels of renewables, trying to also understand how they may be able to deal with the intermittency. Because it, it just simply costs more money if you don't. With U.S. prices. U.S. prices, not with LPG. Yeah, I mean, people are often paying 20, 30 cents. So we'll move on to Klaus. Yeah, I, I think I'm actually inquiring in a very similar direction. And I, I started out with okay, we should just not just sell power, but services. And I'd, I'd like to sort of clarify what actually is behind it. And I, I do understand it at some level, but assume I own a solar panel, I'm intermittent, I can't help it, so now what services can I actually offer? Or are you telling me that the services are the other end? But I, I do see that there is a, if there is a real market price for the power, uh, which is actually coming through at the consumer level, then I say, well, an LED is much smarter than a light bulb because at night electricity is more expensive than during the day because a lot, most of the guys out there uh, are solar panels and not windmills. And therefore, if I know how the grid will look, I can plan on that. But now what services can I offer? I can offer to turn the light off on that end. I, can, I cannot really offer standby power on a solar panel. Either I have it or I don't. Uh, so what exactly are those services? So, so <clears throat> let, let me give you an example. Just make it yeah. concrete. Yeah, let's make an example. So I went to a 20 kW system in Kenya, power hive system. It's running three or four inverters, um, they and a battery system to provide 24-7 uh, AC power. And there's a situation where, in fact, uh, because it's sunny there quite a bit, and because they have a peak, a couple of peaks, um, that from about 10 a.m. till about 4 p.m. on a, any given day, the system may be only drawing uh, 7 kW. Uh, yet it's a 20 kW system. If you send out the right price signals to say, this is a good time to be gr grinding uh, grain and we'll offer you a, a, a appropriate price incentive to do that, you're going to start to sweat the asset a lot better. And yeah, you're gonna isn't that really just strictly selling power and you say it varies, the price of power varies over the course of the day? So that's not a new service. Standby power, I see a new service, right? I can see alternate services to just power. You just gave me and said, look, right now it's cheap. You'd be foolish not to run your windmill, your, your, your grain mill, because, because right now you get a good price. And concomitantly, don't run it at other times. Right. 
Yeah, I, I guess. But, but that strictly is a power service, at least the way I would have looked at it. I, I have uh, uh, two questions that I'd like to pose. Uh, the first r relates to the, the fact that as you increase the penetration of your various different production sources, or for that, for that matter, storage or any of these other things, at, at some point you need to curtail production, and we add in these other elements such as demand response and, and storage, which have some cost associated with them, in order to try to reduce that and to shift energy loads and demands in time. And, and so what I'm curious about is when you're getting into this range of 80%, what amount of curtailment are you seeing in your sort of optimal models using the intermittence? Because that, that is, um, I, I think, a good, sort of a good metric or number to be aware of. Uh, and if it's, it's fungible in the sense that you can add more storage, you have less curtailment. The, the second question relates to sort of another uh, uh, production technology, which would be nuclear. And so I'd be very interested in what happens if you add production into these models uh, that has the uh, sort of the basic characteristics that, that, that nuclear would have. I, now, I can't claim that it would be affordable, but the, the basic, well, it could or might not be. If the French are going to sell it to you, it won't. And I, I can describe why. But, but the, the, the basic characteristic is that your, your power production is going to be relatively uniform, but you can curtail. And you will curtail if needed. And you, I, I think it's reasonable to assume that we can, we can make reactors curtail if needed. And then the other, the other element is that about 10 to 20 percent of the production uh, uh, can be uh, removed because you will perform scheduled refueling and other outages at the optimal time of years. And so you'll have some ability to load follow on a seasonal basis with nuclear. So if you, if you add in various different amounts of nuclear along with intermittent renewables, the solar and wind, does, how, do, how does things change and particularly in terms of your utilization of this large investment that's needed to put in storage and to put in demand response? I guess, Per, for, for the second question, I don't really know the answer. I'm not even sure I have a gut feel because until I kind of understand how much the, the nuclear could flex and what the cost of that is, it, but, 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 but I guess the, the right, right way to answer that is it would be interesting to drop it into the model and see what the answer is. And yeah, um, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, the, uh, for a national system, it's around 7% of generation from wind and solar to tail, uh, 8%. Uh, regardless of whether you've got nuclear, uh, it's about 7%, 7 or 8%, uh, regardless of whether you've got nuclear. So um, in, in the chart that you showed there, you're just filling a gap, so it doesn't really matter what you're putting in. It's that last uh, bit of, and how you organize the grid around the last bit as it starts deviating off. Um, so if you add nuclear as base load or load following at the, the bottom, it doesn't, it doesn't really overly change uh, the dynamics of what happens at the, the very top end because it's still um, just the choice of the variable generators. So as, as you get to bigger areas, you can choose that. and back up to 100%. And you end up at the end with the same sort of numbers because you're using wind and solar, which is much cheaper. And when you optimally dispatch a system, uh, sorry, wind and solar, you use, lot, you use the wind and solar towards the end, you curtail that because it's cheaper to curtail that than it is to ramp down the nuclear. That's something that's on the nuclear is more expensive, which is not a physics-based thing. It's a, it's a logistics-based 
problem that we have right now. Well, I would get there's a few involved which you have to draw. Closer to address them too. Yes. <clears throat> but I, I, I think that's a, in a way if you just look at a brute force dispatch model, you were going to say right now the price of electricity is X. And so my marginal cost or my, my operating cost is Y if, if, if that matches, I bid, right? Now, the net present value of your <laughs> investment may turn out to be positive or negative. So whether you want nuclear on there or not, becomes exactly that question, how much do you, does your capital cost in the background go? And if you are asked to be more and more curtailed, your net present value comes down, so you say, I will never build another nuclear power plant. Right. So, so you, and that's why it's so difficult to get this right. And I think it's hopeless to do this as a planned economy sitting around a table to, to try to figure it out. You, you really have to have a market to make that happen. I can't, I can't predict how much nuclear wants to be in there because it depends on who else is playing, right? If there's lots of batteries, the nuclear may not, may not matter. And it now may be a 5% price difference between X and Y, which decides whether you have a 10% more or less of the market. And that's what makes it so complicated. But, but all of the technologies are subject to the same problem. As they expand their penetration, their, their, their revenues drop off because every one of them will eat its own lunch in one way and, and that's why it's so nice to be granular. Right? If you can come in in small amounts and don't last very long, you can test okay. the work. Yeah. Need let to move just, on to Ken now? Let me just answer your second question though, because there was a second part, which is how much, and, and basically this flexibility that we've modeled here reduces over generation by about 40% compared to the non-flexible case. So bring the discussion back to demand management. The, uh, could you give us some idea of where the low-hanging fruit is in demand manage management, which sectors are relatively easy and large? And then the second question I have is, could you give us some idea of the technologies for demand management? I know that some people just talk about behavior and telling people what to do, and others automated systems that respond to price signals and so on. So, right. so let me just yeah, answer both of those questions again. So, Smart domestic hot water, so basically, you know, making hot water at the right time. Um, smart electric heating, so heating at the right time. Uh, smart plug loads, recharging all our devices at the right time. Uh, smart charging on EV and, and smart cooling, all the ones that are in the money right now. And I can tell you uh, sort of the basis for, uh, yeah, a lot of smart things there. So, so if, there mind, if, there was a, if there was the correct dynamic pricing, to respond to, or more <coughs> money with current pricing. What do you mean? Yeah, just give me a second and think about that. I think it's the first, but I, yeah. I, I want to make sure. Yeah, no, I think it is a dynamic pricing. Thank you. Yeah. But, but it is complicated. I at home have a dynamic price. I pay twice as much between noon and 7 p.m. Oh, and that's I pay not, that's not true money. dynamic pricing that's sending these signals. Yeah. I, I get that, but it's already some level. So that's okay. That's, that's what I said. basically said his model basically would be an economically smart optimum response to an optimum hourly or minute by minute dynamic price as to what would be in the money right now. So Bree the other day was mentioned about the Australian electricity market where it goes up to four thousand dollars a kilowatt hour or something sometimes. Then you have capacity pricing. So the more you have capacity pricing, the more you're disincentivizing right. demand management. Right. So yeah. Um right. Do, well, okay. Do you want me to go back to answering yeah. your question? So uh, under the, the residential plug loads, it was basically just smart controls and charging at the right time. Um, the cooling and commercial residential cooling was really around ice, ice storage. That's the technology there. Um, the residential commercial space heating is using electrothermal uh, storage, so you're heating bricks at the right time and, and then using that energy. Uh, domestic hot water is just smart controls, turn them on at the right time. So n nothing earth shattering here. EVs just, you know, build the algorithm so you don't charge during the peak. Um, and then everything below that we didn't actually model as a, as a flex. So these ones here, just, these are X's, not checks. So they, they weren't actually part of the model. So before uh, passing on to Jack, there, there are a few opportunities for the last 20% that have not yet emerged. Uh, one that we've looked at recently is actually on data centers. 
uh, which provide a really great opportunity. It's only 2% of total electricity consumption in the US, but you can actually shift it and, and basically transition from loads in electricity to just basically information uh, and play with uh, high intensity of uh, carbon intensity or differences in LMP prices from region to region. And in a country as in the United States, where the peak in loads in data centers is going to be different given the, the, uh, the, the time difference between the, the coasts, the opportunity is really there. So if, uh, it, it has been a, an interesting case with some flexibility that folks have not considered yet. And okay. were you looking at any particular type of data centers? Were they five nines data centers? Or? So it was, we're, using that, uh, we're using data from Akamai, and so mostly looking at shifting loads associated with video streaming. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I have a, uh, first of all, I want to say that it's, it's very important to actually implement these sorts of things, uh, especially the, the smart charging and the smart implementation, demand response. It's, it's a no-brainer. This is what we got to do as one of the mechanisms for um, introducing flexibility. I, I want to comment on this chart, though, because it seems to me that with the relative small amount of demand response that you implemented, you were able to actually capture almost all of the opportunity, it looks like to me. Almost all that is left in your flexible case is seasonal load shifting, it seems to me. If it looks, you, looks pretty good, if, if I, okay? If I, yeah, it's, and so it seems to me that that is what else we must do, is to, is to look for technologies that can do the seasonal shifting. And, uh, Pear mentioned this nuclear option as a seasonal shifter, but there also are the seasonal shifts that you can accommodate with other massive energy storage uh, technologies like pumped hydro, uh, hydrogen energy storage, and the like. I guess my comment would be is if, if, if you want to afterwards, I can show you there, every one of those little pixels actually has a number associated with it. You know, whether it's minus 1.62 times 10 to the 6 or plus 2.4 times 10 to the 9. So we can, you can actually see at a much more detailed level what's really going on. Um, I, I think it's not just seasonal. I think there really are issues around several days to a fortnight right. that we're going to have to Correct. deal with this too. But, but, but those are almost all out of the space of, outside of the space of what you actually simulated here. I, I agree. And, okay. I, and I, I don't think, and, and, and Joe may have some ideas coming out of the Stanford work, right. that, um, that we can imagine stretching our, our cooling storage for more than a, a couple of days at the moment <clears throat> without having a hell of a lot of water. And, I, and I've done some work with Carleton College in Minnesota where there's a lot of wind and I've, I've made arguments that says under their gigantic green in the middle of the college that they might put a huge tank and use wind energy to dump heat into it because they have an incredible wind resource. But, yeah. but in most places, it's like, you know, you know, like in New York City, where are you going to put it? Yeah, I, I just want to suggest that it also has implications with regard to mm -hmm. your uh, master planning of matching loads <laughs> with um, uh, the demand, matching the demand with the available resources as you build out a new economy. Uh, there are going to be some constraints that are going to be pretty difficult, like this seasonal variation. Oh yeah, no, that's that's. I mean, if you're going to the takeaway from these minutes is we were pleasantly surprised that it was five percent of load or twenty five percent of the problem. Uh, there are a number of things that if we don't get the uh, policies and codes and regulations in now, it's pipe dream, but, but they are certainly tractable. Um, and, and then the rest of it is what do you do about the fortnight or the five days or the, see, that, it's, it's, it's that straightforward, I think. Yeah, I, I'm just um, asking some bit technical question on the, the image uh, there. So when, when they did that uh, plot, how did they choose uh, the capacity to expand around? Was it least cost, highest capacity factor? Uh, and this one here? Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know the details of that. Uh, it was something that folks did at RMI about a year ago when we were first looking at what happens at very high levels of penetration, actually vis-a-vis -vis EV work. So, I, I, you know, I, we can get on the phone with Mark Dyson, but I, I don't want to make up what the answer is because I don't actually know the details of that. Yeah, because um, the thing that we keep finding and, and one that if RMI is finding the same is of, uh, I, I completely agree that demand management is going to help you uh, shift the load to some degree, but 
We can also work on the generation side of building generation in places that's more correlated to the either local demand or a distant demand rather than just placing it where the highest capacity factor is, which yeah, so can have I, lower value to the grid. Yeah, no, so I think I, now I think I can answer your, your question. Because we used ERCOT as our basic model, um, I don't think we put in, well, wouldn't it be better to put the wind in here versus the wind in there? I'm, I'm almost positive that's the case. You mentioned a couple of things around water, but it was mostly heating and cooling. And I guess the question that I have is given that it's for Texas and there's a bigger ecosystem to think about, did you also include pumping, desalination, water transportation, which would be a very big issue in California, uh, as we know, because it's a third of the peak load or something like that. But in Texas, particularly thinking toward 2050, et cetera? No, so, um, no, it's a good question. We did not tailor it for other kind of more uh, <coughs> unique loads, such as water pumping that you would find in California. We simply scaled the loads that we were modeling in ERCOT, of which there's not that much water pumping, and I don't think there's much desal. And so those, those two in particular certainly were not modeled and carried through. So the, you know, obviously one of the next steps out of this piece of work would just be to say, well, how do you try to do this for 50 states? Um, and how do you take into account regional and state differences for what the real loads are? Yeah, yeah the more important issue is that there's severe water stress and anticipated water stress, not only in Texas, but in many other places. Yep. And that one of the larger possible DR loads going forward is actually about water processing and purification. Yep. And, and, and you know, when you're thinking about studies that go out Couple of decades beyond, that's actually a, a, a real problem or a real opportunity uh, to, to consider. Yeah, no, and the, and the team actually did talk about that. Not in fact that wa creating water, and, and this is an, uh, something I work on in Aruba. Uh, all the water in, in, that's consumed in Aruba, whether you're showering it, drinking it, or cooking with it, is 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 all desal. And so, actually thinking about that as a way to use energy at the right time when the wind is blowing down there and storing it is, is a very uh, important topic. They're expensive. So therefore, it doesn't want to stay in diet. Again, as always, Sorry, you got to trade, you got to, got to trade off the economics. <laughs> Yeah, so I had a question actually about the um, high frequency response, like the high frequency uh, fluctuations in uh, solar and wind supply um, and the role of demand response um, in dealing with that. And um, I don't know if anybody has looked at this, but from what I understand from my power systems engineering friends, it's a really big problem um, because, uh, I mean, I think we all understand the problem, right? So it can destabilize the grid, and I think you don't get much, at least some would argue, you don't get as much balancing by, you know, expanding geographically over those time scales. So sort of second by second. Um, you know, very, very rapid uh, fluctuations. At least there are papers out there and people give talks on, on you know, this, uh, this uh, showing this, it's not my area. So I, but I was wondering if you guys have thought about that because one of the potential solutions to this, which I understand keeps people up at night, um, the problem keeps people up at night and one of the only solutions I've, I've heard proposed is demand side management that would be automated um, you know, for example, if we had HVAC systems at that, you know, depending on what those systems look like, they could be turned on and off automatically to deal with these fluctuations and have a very fast response time. So, uh, because it's a, it's a difficult prediction problem, whereas um, some of the other um, challenges in, in matching supply and demand in a, you know, stochastic system are, are easier to deal with from what I understand, but at those very short time scales. I think the prediction, from what I've heard, the prediction problem is more difficult, and so you can't really predict. You have to be, you basically need an instantaneous response. So I, I don't know if you've thought about that, Stephen, or yeah. if somebody else wants to comment on it. I'm sure there's 
people who will have more to say than me, but here's what I'd say about what we did is, you know, one, I'm not a power engineer, but I'm aware of those problems because we certainly see them on the grid in, in Africa uh, in, in certain cases where there's no spinning reserves. The, um, the, w w I talked to Mark about this explicitly, and I can't tell you what the time scale is, but he said, look, what we modeled takes in, into account a lot of the sort of shorter duration transients, but whether that's at the one second time scale, I'm not sure. When you have things like electrothermal storage, just heating bricks, I can very easily imagine that technology turning on and off on very short time scales. Uh, compressor technologies would be very unhappy. So it's going to be uh, a matter of what the technology is to be able to be amenable to that. Just limited to the one second. I mean, if we have even, you know, higher frequency. Oh, yeah, no, and, and there's probably yeah. others here yeah. might have some. So we're going to have very, very frequent responses also to that question from Jessica by Brian. So if you're looking at a large system, such as the scale of ERCOT, you cannot worry whatsoever about the second to second type issues. There is no way that a wind plant in West Texas and one on the Gulf Coast are going to do the exact same thing at the same time. That's just physically impossible. If you're looking at microgrids, yes, that is a very large concern. Distribution networks, it becomes a concern depending on how large what how what the scale is you're balancing at things like that. I'm that they would do exactly the same thing at the same time, but I think that there's also a constraint in terms of the spatial distribution and and grid st grid stability at that. I, I mean, I, I don't know. Again, it's not it's something that's been raised in multiple contexts as a big as a big problem so, or as a problem and yeah. a solution that's been proposed. At the seconds to minutes time scale, even up to the hour time scale, you see very little correlation at things. At distances greater than right. 50 yeah. kilometers? Yeah. yeah. How much are you worried about? That's like, not what that we're worried about. about the average, right? She's worried about this frequency. huge frequency on top of it as to whether or not that can be averaged or that ends up as some destabilization or loss or something. I don't know the answer to this, right. but you're, you're talking across purposes here. Yeah. That's, no, it's so, fine. I mean, we might not be able to. I just wanted to throw it. I mean, one, one of the key things about you know wind and solar generators is that they're individually very small, right? And so you have you have one three megawatt turbine doing something is absolutely nothing in the context of ERCOT, right? If you have a so you're saying there's not much today. noise on that. There's it's a slowly varying curve, not something with exactly. High I, I, I think once you get down to this level, it's probably, as you said, more local. But you get voltage mismatches, you get phase mismatches, and I think at some point you don't predict them, you react. So that, that, that means you have some reactive power at standby in the system, and that is one of the things I would have considered another service. Right? There is somebody at standby with a flywheel or, and, and can push the phase back to where it has to be. Yeah, but, that's what but those doing. things are designed right now. If I turn on a big, big motor on the system, somebody has to pick up that inductive load. Yeah, but that's coming yeah. from, that, that's sort of predictable, right? There's no, I just is. flick a switch and somebody, <laughs> somebody at the other end has to help me. <laughs> so you turn on the light. Oh, right, on the demand side, right. But that's, right, yeah. Sure. Right now right. it's a big inertia yeah. in a power plant and that will go away. Right. Um, I think uh, the point about uh, the larger scale portfolio management thing is well established, but the um, problem can arise when you're looking at a small distribution system or a microgrid like what you were talking about, Bri, um, and that is a real thing. Like when a cloud bank comes over a high penetration rooftop solar distribution system. But um, advanced inverters with power electronics that change the power angle for those rooftop solar systems, if they're well integrated with um, the types of technologies that you were talking about with smart uh, hot water and smart HVAC and stuff like that, you can, you, it's, it's, it's totally a manageable problem. I think that uh, it has to do with control systems and software and making sure that those things are, are linked up in a way that's smart. I'm going, to, I'm going to be really quick. We've got um, 
We've been in a lot of conversations with NERC because this is kind of um, mainly being propagated out from NERC um, that wind and solar are going to destroy their reliability constraints. And um, what, we, what we find is we spend a lot of time with them because growing the grid actually does help you. And these wind generators, um, there is inertia in them. There is waveforms, time frames. Uh, and actually, if you go to some wind farms and, and uh, talk with them, they can actually react faster than the grid can actually react, and they've had to slow down or dampen their reaction speeds because the wind turbines, because they're so small, can react much faster than the grid can actually um, keep up. And so when you aggregate that over big areas, these wind farms can actually work together to really stabilize the grid rather than uh, mismanage it. PV is a little bit harder, but they've now there's smart inverters and things like that. But as you go to bigger and bigger scales, the, the propagation time actually helps you rather than hinders you. In these small grids, these problems propagate really fast and disrupt the whole grid really quickly, whereas over these much bigger grids, propagation time is slower, and a lot of your generators can re respond much faster, and they're actually very, very good at this. And if you go to MISO and look at their, their data, they found that their, their ACE has gone down since they've been thinking about this problem with wind, and they're using wind in a very uh, smart way to really reduce that error and get rid of fossil fuel having to do uh, a lot of that work. So um, there's the, like we talked earlier, the, the, the knowledge is there, but it's taking time for it to propagate out to the, the wider community because... Um, is difficult. Um, I agree with all the comments here, but this is still a problem that I believe requires research. Um, there still are, especially I think in the communications aspect of this. For example, um, you cannot communicate on the waveform level fast enough to address an issue if it is dramatic. Um, and so if wind farm goes down very quickly, for example, like it does sometimes, um, you can have waveform level disturbances that are not not easily managed because the communication times aren't fast enough. So there is this need for there to be good citizen behavior, good citizen behavior, and this interaction of how you manage all the inverters, how the inverters interact with one another. That still is, I think, a research question as to how to do. So, they have the capability to do this, but we don't know yet how to make that all work automatically. The system is designed to handle much larger disturbances than that. Yeah. I mean, when Palo Verde goes out and you lose two gigawatts of generation at the same time, the system has enough contingency reserves to respond to yeah, that. that. That's the contingency with current spinning reserves. Yes. What, when, we, when we don't have those any longer on the grid, what are we going to do? But you don't have those massive drops. You can't have a wind You can't, have, you you can't have two down. gigawatts of wind going on at the same but, time. But locally, you can have that be a very large disturbance in your local area. This is why, and you're agreeing and with you, me on that. And you can, in the yeah. microgrid, in the distribution yeah. system right there, and you're going to have that yeah. problem. Yeah, and you can have voltage control efforts. That's why you have capital. That's, 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 that's where I think you need to have the research. So, exactly. So that, exactly. re that research is already underway in something called the Grid Modernization Initiative that the Department of Energy started in January. There are 87 different projects, $220 million in federal R&D over the next three years on just those precise points. And, and, and let me just say that, you know, from the perspective of the MISO and the Southwest Power Pool, integrating wind into large belt power grids is a solved problem. It's a solved problem because of all the operational flexibility that they have, the new generation of power electronics that the wind turbines bring, and the fact that we're getting increasingly better at predicting these disturbances, right? Which is kind of to Jessica's point, um, what you need in order to be able to see these disturbances before they come. We're not that far away on doing the same thing on solar. If you look at the results of the solar forecast improvement project, project that, that NREL and NCAR and others have been involved in and implementations of those outcomes in places like Arizona with high penetrations of PV in, in urban areas. We're getting very good at being able to predict the grid services that are needed to keep the grid reliable from a voltage, reactive power, frequency response standpoint. In my view, none of that matters for the last 20 percent. Okay. What the, the only barrier that that might limit you with is the amount of renewables you can host at the distribution edge of the grid. And that's where I think some of the things that Stephen brought in about the smart devices and model predictive control of different loads and kind of shaping the load to fit the in situ demand. The reason we do that now, absent a price signal for doing so, is to minimize the back feed 
onto the bulk power system and thus avoid any of these, these transient problems. And that'll, that'll continue. But in my view, that is a solved problem. The bigger problem for the last 20%, going back to, I think it was a point that Pear was raising, and even back to Nate's discussion yesterday, is if I have an asset, a wind turbine, a nuclear plant, whatever it is, I'm over here as the non-economist struggling with everything that I learned from Jay and others, which is if I have an asset, I want to maximize its utilization because that's a lower cost alternative. So instead of turning down the nuclear plant, as Chris's model would do, why am I not thinking about what other products that are valuable that that nuclear plant could provide? Hydrogen, thermal energy for district heating, synthetic fuels, all the cycles that Nate talked about yesterday. Why are we not thinking about how those assets can serve multiple purposes and in so doing really move demand for electricity around the way we need it? To me, that's the, the R&D agenda for the last 20%, particularly if what we're trying to do is create drop-in fuels that are carbon bearing, but don't come from carbon to begin with. And, and so you'll see a report, which I'll hopefully share as soon as it gets published today, where we're dipping our toes at NREL into this field in, in the context of nuclear and renewable hybrid systems. But I mean, if we're talking last 20%, 2050, we're talking gigawatts of stuff. Little solar panels on rooftops. Now we've got to move big swings of, of you know, energy around if, if we're going to make a difference. Is it out? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> See, that's, that's what being in management means, is that I'm the last one to know. <laughs> Nate, Thank you, Brian. I agree. Nate, you, you had a question? Is, is no, that... I don't. My okay, question so move to Joe. Joe? Seems to me that... Um, once we do electrify everything and we have a balance of energy needs that we can electrify, the air, the ships, the long distance trucking, that even though building heating, cooling power today uses 40 or 42 percent of the total energy, when you take out the mobile things that aren't going to be electrified, that probably jumps to 50 percent and the heating and cooling component may jump to a third. So um, thermal storage seems to me is a huge potential tool for this demand management because you can shift, you can take almost 33% in theory of the load and shift it, shift it all. You can discharge from thermal storage with just a little pumping energy and really shave a lot of peaks. So is there any R&D or, or mass analysis of that potential uh, as perhaps the biggest single demand response tool available? It's 33% of total electrical load could be shut right off if everybody had thermal storage. But I, I mean, I think that's more or less what this analysis is showing that on a 24 hour cycle, moving heating and cooling around is fairly facile and there's ways that we could make it more cost effective. It's when you get beyond the 24 hour period that, you know, if you, whatever, if you have a million gallons that you're storing today for a six hour shift, if it's going to be for 168 hours or a week, that's a lot more water. Well, that's a presumption of using tanks for thermal storage, but the ground is a huge, um, it's infinite thermal storage. If you have perched ground or no water, you put in heat, it stays there, you take it out. If you have moving groundwater, it's like an Amazon. You can take it, put whatever you want, throw the cover. It works either way. So I just like to see that quantified. Uh, so yeah, that's just another form of of what a battery or compressed air or some other storage technology that might be useful if uh, certainly water is cheap, but it's the heat capacity of water versus the bond energy and the fuel versus the battery storage capacity. So it belongs on the plot and then needs to be evaluated for if there's a sweet spot somewhere that's implementable. Yeah. Last year, someone asked me to write something about the demand response in China. So I look into the issue. And my, the, the, my quick conclusion is that they are in a very good position to use that because they, their smart meter penetration rate is like 100% and the grid company is like, is, and also you, if you look at like an electric vehicle, there are already 200 million electric bike and scooter connected to the grid mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. yeah. And my conclusion is they are not going to do it because the grid, the grid 
Greek corporations, their revenue depends on how much electricity they carry. If they reduce the load, then they lose their revenue. So they have no incentive to do that. So if we want China to do something like that, you need to make their system more like America, like a, have a competitive market, reduce the power of the Greek corporation. But the same, the, I know we are not supposed, we are supposed to like uh, assume all the institutional barrier can be fi already figured out, but how you figure that out it has a lot of impact. Right now, China can build so many pan hydro because the Greek company is very powerful. They own the, they own pan hydro, they use pan hydro, they set the price. Cost only matter when you cannot set the price. If you can set the price, you don't care. And so, so if you try to make the Chinese, you should see market more like America. You enable demand response, and then kill, you kill pump hydro. So it's kind of, I don't know, it's like a very difficult issue to get over. I, I, know, I, I agree with you. I mean, it, it is a little off topic for today. The, the team that we have in China right now working on electricity, one of the key things they're trying to do is introduce some sort of market-based mechanisms <clears throat> rather than everybody gets a dispatch at 50% their particular coal plant. And until that happens, everything else is a pipe dream. I wanted to explore a little further the comment that Brian just made about uh, having a diversity of places to put the excess energy and, and how that interacts with demand response. And one of the things that's been really interesting about the conversation is whether there are going to be a, a few uh, intermediate carriers that serve as the kind of connecting points for the diverse outlets and inlets of the system or whether we really need to think about developing the primary electricity generation in a way that, that connects directly with the diversity of um, potential storage or load shifting mechanisms. And I wonder you know, where, where we are in terms of thinking about uh, whether uh, you know, f we're far enough along to say, for example, hydrogen or another intermediate storage is going to be uh, uh, one of a small number of keys along maybe with uh, thermal storage or whether we really need to think about uh, these super diverse systems where we have 10 different outlets for the energy that, that's no longer needed for the grid. I'll open that one up to the floor. <clears throat> I'll just um, <clears throat> point out that the sort of next big thing on the horizon from a federal R&D standpoint in this space is looking at hydrogen at scale as kind of the the, the proton alternative to the electron, and, and part of that is being motivated by a recognition that in certain applications, like the ones that we talked about yesterday, the you just simply can't densify electricity enough to provide the energy per unit volume that you need to, to create that economic good. Uh, and so the question becomes then, how does hydrogen get created in a way that is zero carbon? And how do you move it around? How do you store it? All the things that we talked about previously. Um, the thermal one we shouldn't ignore. Um, our own data center at NREL uses the waste heat from the chips of the high performance computer to heat water, uh, to warm water, not hot water, um, so it doesn't go to the old central heating system, but we anticipate building out the rest of our campus using this not 160 degree but 93 degree water in a variety of applications for district heating and building performance. We're currently already offsetting some of our fossil use. Uh, in the lab for, for other purposes. Um, we can go one step further and use the excess production of renewable electricity from our rooftop PV solar system to generate hydrogen that can be stored inside the building and run back through a fuel cell that provides both reliability to the, to the data center but also virtually will eliminate its carbon footprint when we're done. And we hope that that will be one of the first carbon-free data centers, albeit as, at a smaller scale, uh, anywhere in the world. So, so kind of this systems engineering and thinking, I think, is something that it, it makes problems tractable at a small level if, and, and I'll just end with this, if the institutions and the business models and the rates and the prices all get set right. I was here last weekend across the way at the Aspen Institute, and we were talking about the very same thing in demand response that Stephen raised earlier, which is we've got all these smart devices and processes that can provide services, but no markets to pay them. And the reason that we don't have markets to pay them is because the market makers aren't convinced that the devices and processes can work. And so we've got a bit of a chicken and an egg problem here. 
And to echo one of the, um, the earlier morning session panelists, this is a place where R&D should take the form of kind of a just go do it trial at places like Stanford and Irvine and elsewhere. That's great, now let's 10X that and, and see if it scales. I'd just like to add something you said, Brian. We all sort of act like this is going to happen, but we need to think about the consumer here as well. Um, what are the incentives really to adopt? Will they adopt? Um, and it, it's not clear they will. I, I was at a you know Edison Electric Institute meeting some years ago. All these CEOs were there. They were talking about smart smart power, smart grid. And one of them described how his utility had mailed out all these sort of smart meter packages to all these customers to, to be the first test. It was voluntary. They almost all got mailed back unopened. So I, I think we should not underestimate the fact that the consumer, we're st once you're inside the home, you're dealing with the consumer. And we have to think about how they're going to be incented and educated and will adopt this stuff fairly quickly. And just a two-finger wave on that, the Nest participants in the dialogue over at the Aspen Institute stated that 40% of the U.S. population has access to some form of a dynamic or time of use rate. Only 4% of them actually take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll conclude in just thinking that when, when you look at the series of, of uh, suggested solutions that we've been talking about, it's likely that at least a part of the in terms of, of uh, controls and solutions that the consumer actually doesn't have to, to deal with will be bundled in the 80%. I'll suggest we didn't talk as much about that, but in the last 20%, I think we're going to be stuck with things that are more, much more related to behavior and the very low plasticity of consumers that you have. It's going to be pushed aside to the last few steps. And with that, we conclude. I'd like to thank Doug uh, for a very, very nice presentation. <laughs>